Okay, so this is going to be a video to replace an older video where uh, there were a few mistakes in the math that I think were important enough that it's worth redoing. So this is a video on backpropagation, and uh, this is a you know a key algorithm in the uh, operation of neural networks. So backpropagation is how we compute the gradient of some loss function, some function we want to minimize um, with respect to the parameters of the neural network. So backpropagation works like this. So you first compute the hidden unit activations, uh, and that's done through forward propagation, which is the procedure for predicting something in a neural network or with a neural network. And then, then what we do is we compute the gradient at the output layer, and, and that's often referred to as the error. Um, and then we propagate that error back one layer at a time. And what this propagation that's going backwards one layer at a time is, is uh, computing is the chain rule. It's essentially computing the chain rule, um, which is you can view as a recursive definition for what the, uh, the derivative is of a nested function. And it'll com it computes this recursive uh, uh, representation of the gradient uh, via dynamic programming. And the dynamic pro programming comes from the, uh, the fact that we're going to store the hidden unit activations and be able to reuse those. And we're going to store the gradients or the errors that we compute and use those to compute each uh, preceding layer. So we're going to start at the end and, pre and go backwards. So our plan for this video is we're going to start by computing gradients by hand, uh, so to speak, or, or actually trying to derive them and calculate them as if we're solving a calculus problem. Uh, and then we're going to look for common patterns for organizing the backpropagation algorithm. And we're going to find some commonalities that allow us to write down what we did by hand as a, an algorithm. And then after that, I'm going to give you a general matrix form for feed-forward neural networks that uh, we won't derive, but maybe with some pen and paper nearby, you can work out how the uh, general algorithm I describe is, in fact, the, or translates in the matrix form to the matrix uh, recipe I'm going to give you at the end. So to begin with, um, we've seen before the uh, logistic squashing function. So I've, I've shown you in previous videos and uh, where I discussed neural networks and before that where I discussed logistic regression, uh, this squashing function. So uh, previously I may not have called it a squashing function, but let's call it a squashing function now. So what, the reason it's a squashing function is because its input you know, is a range from minus infinity to positive infinity, and its output's going to be some number between 0 and 1. So it squashes the range, or squashes the domain into a small range. Uh, and then in addition to just looking at the squashing function, which we've done in the past, uh, we're also going to want to calculate its derivative. So its derivative is how it changes relative to its input. And if you do the math, uh, you know, just some basic calculus, because this is a one-dimensional function, you get that the derivative is this form on the right. So d sigma of x over dx is equal to sigma of x times 1 minus sigma of x. So it's kind of a funny looking derivative, but it makes sense if you think about it, right? If you, if you start to imagine what the slope of this function is, it, it, it makes sense. So we're gonna keep this around, right? We're gonna try, just remember this derivative and it will show up again and we're gonna use it to calculate the derivative of the neural network itself. So let's look at that neural network I showed you in one of the previous videos. And this is just a simple two layer neural network. And you know, I'm going to call it a two-layered neural network. I think a lot of people would agree it's two layers, but you know, it looks like there's actually three layers. So uh, I guess the idea is that we don't count the input layer, right? because every neural network has an input layer. So we count it as uh, two layers, um, where the h's are one layer, and then the y is the last layer. So the mathematical way to write this down, so I drew, you know, this is just a picture. So the mathematical way is to have an expression like this, where uh, you have h one, which is the hidden unit activation uh, in, the, in that middle layer, and that's determined by weights 1, 1, where I'm indexing 1, 1 to mean it's the first layer and then the first hidden unit. So the first one is for the first layer, and the second one is for the uh, hidden unit. So 
we then also have a, a different weight vector for H2. So the hidden, the second unit's hidden uh, activation value uh, is determined by weight vector 1, 2. Right, again, layer 1, unit 2. So together, these two H's form a, a hidden unit, a hidden activation vector H without any uh, subscript, which is just the concatenation of H1 and H2. And if there were more hidden units, it would be more, there would be more units in that vector. But for this simple problem, we just have two hidden units. So then the last layer, the last layer is determined by um, some, another weight vector, uh, W21. So it's layer two, unit one. So following that scheme, uh, we can also write the entire neural network as a nested function. So this is the nested function form of this small neural network. So you can see that it's, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a sigma, so it's a squashing function applied to the weights of the last layer times the hidden layer activation, uh, which is itself the output of a bunch of squashing functions, or two squashing functions. So one important thing to notice here is that I, the way I've written it is that I've written it as p of y given x equal to this. And that's not always the case with a neural network, right? Technically, you know, we've seen logistic regression models, which are which which we like to interpret as probabilities. But but for neural networks, we don't often require that the output is a probability. In fact, we just think of the output as just some number or some vector, or even some tensor sometimes. But in this case, it's a single scalar number that's between zero and one, and it makes sense to interpret as a probability. Although we don't have to. Um, in this case, we will, and that's going to uh, lead to it will give us some guidance about what loss function we use. And I should add that I'm using shorthand here where I say p of y given x, what that should be, be written as in the long form would be the probability that y is true given x. Or in the classification setting that the y is a positive label. It's a probability that y is a positive label given x. Okay, so let's keep these definitions around and let's start to think about computing gradients. So why do we compute gradients? Well, we're going to compute a gradient of the loss function because we're going to try to optimize it. In this case, I'm actually going to write the positive log likelihood. as That will be our function, our, our objective function. And I'm going to try to avoid calling it a loss function, although I might slip. Uh, so th in this case, it's not a loss function because we want it to be big. The larger the log likelihood, the more, the better our model fits the data. And what people typically do in practice is they'll write the negative log likelihood and try to minimize that. But that's just a weird convention of optimization analysis and software that people like to minimize uh, rather than maximize. But let's just try to maximize because it's the same thing. So here's the subtlety. The subtlety which uh, is causing me to re-record this video is that when I write the p of uh, you know p of y given x, like I said in the last slide, it's I, I mean the probability that y is the true label, is the positive label given x. So when I write you know p of y i given x i, that's a little different. That means that that's the probability of the label y i that we receive. So the y i might not be true. Y i might be positive or negative. In fact we're going to assume that it's going to be a value of either plus one or minus one, and that's going to give us some notational convenience. So we can start by, by taking uh, the, using the chain rule to work out the derivative with respect to this log, the outer log. Um, and that's not too bad. Basically, all we get is a one over p of y given xi, uh, p of yi given xi, uh, and, and then all that multiplied by the derivative or the gradient of the actual probability uh, or the likelihood, the likelihood uh, given the um, or the derivative of the likelihood with respect to w21. Oh, so and first we're gonna we're gonna start with just w21. We're gonna figure out its derivative, and then we're gonna work on w11. And the punchline, the thing that we're looking for, is that we're gonna find common things in those calculations that we can reuse so that we don't have to compute the, compute the whole thing all over again when we, when we calculate 1, 1, or calculate the derivative for 1, 1. So continuing along, we can actually uh, replace some of these probabilities with uh, their more precise form. So I'm going to write this form. So here we have, uh, I haven't done anything between the, the top line and the second line. All I've done is replace you know, the, the likelihood of yi given xi with uh, 
the formulaic uh, form of that, the, the, the algebraic form of that, um, which is weird, a little weird because I, I've, that, that yi has been snuck inside the logistic function or the squashing function. And the, and the reason this works is because of the symmetry of the logistic function, and it doesn't always work this way, but this is just a nice, nice trick that if you want to get the probability of a plus one or negative one outcome uh, coming out of a logistic probability, uh, you can just multiply the input to the logistic function by positive one or negative one. And you can see, see this easily for the positive case, right? For the positive case, uh, the output of the logistic is the probability of the positive outcome, so that's the likelihood of the positive label. For the negative case, it's a little bit harder to see, but you can actually, let me just bounce back and just give you the visual. So, so looking at the, uh, the, the logistic function, you can see it's symmetric around zero. So you can imagine that one minus this value is equal to uh, the input, the negative input, or the output of the neg with the negative input. But uh, you know, if if you want to spend some more time doing that on pen and paper, you can work it out as well. But so if if you don't see it right now, maybe pause and figure it out, or just uh, you know trust me for now and maybe go back and figure it out later. So there's two pieces to this equa uh, expression on the right. Uh, one is the derivative, and and the derivative of the outer function, and then there's this inner stuff. There's this stuff happening to inside uh, uh, the the outer squashing function. And we're gonna we're gonna do the chain rule again, and we're gonna we the way we do that is we take the derivative of the outer function, and then we multiply that by the derivative of the inner function, and that looks like this. So here we have the derivative of the outer function, which is that that formula I asked you to remember, uh, which is the derivative of the logistic function, right? That's that's the numerator above the you know on top of the fraction, and then we just have the derivative or the gradient of the inner function. Uh, with respect to the, our target variable w21, and then in the denominator, I, re, I also replaced you know p of yi given xi that likelihood term with the uh, this form of likelihood. Okay, so from here, we can uh, cancel out some terms, right? So in the fraction, it's pretty straightforward. You can see the uh, you know sigma y sigma of yi w21 times h. Um, that's all. You know, easy to see that that's the same thing in the denominator, so you can just cancel those terms out. So we end up with this simple, simplified form. It's not that simple yet, but it, you know, it's it's definitely we get rid of a, t a fraction, so that makes it a little easier to work with. And then we can, uh, yeah. So let so we can continue on, and we can see that uh, the derivative, this gradient on the right, this is a gradient of a, a linear function. Right, so it's a linear function or a linear operation on the uh, on this vector w21. Right, we're multiplying w21 by you know yi, which is a scalar, uh, and dotting it with h, dotting it with with h, which is a vector. So the gradient of that is just the those two coefficients. So you get w, you know, you just get y to i times h. And then we can do a little bit more trickery to simplify things even further. Um, and in fact, this simplification just comes from mixing together uh, yi and that one minus sigma term. In fact, wh what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the y inside the sigma. We're going to get rid of the y that's going into the logistic. And what we're essentially doing is undoing the trickery that we did to write the, look, like the likelihood in one simple form like this. Um, so if you work it out, if you work out the case where y is positive and where y is negative, you get these two conditions, right? If it's positive, it just looks like the current fraction or the current, not fraction, but the current expression, um, you know, without the yi, right? Because y is positive. But if it's negative, you get this expression on the bottom where uh, the whole thing inside the parentheses is multiplied by minus one, so it's all negated. Uh, and then what's put passed into the logistic is negated as well. Then using a little bit more trickery, uh, the, the, this, in fact, using the identity that 1 minus the output of the logistic is equal to the logistic itself, time, uh, give, using its negated input, we can get rid of the, negated, uh, the negative input, and we find that we can write the whole expression like this. So the gradient of the log likelihood with respect to uh, W21 is going to be equal to you know, the sum over all the examples of the, an indicator function. That's what this i is, the indicator function of whether y is positive. So uh, minus 
uh, the output of the logistic function, all times the hidden unit activations h. So this i function is just, you know, this is just the indicator function. So it's going to output 1 if that expression is true, and output 0 if that expression is false. So if the example is a negative label, or if the example has a negative label, then that would be 0 minus the logistic function. And if it's a positive label, then that's a 1. So it's useful to look at that expression and think about it a little bit. And, and, and what it, what it, uh, one way to interpret it is to think of the, the i function, that, that, the indicator function, is the true value of whether we, we had a positive label or not. Right? It's, it's just the indicator of whether we had a positive label. So that's the true value. That's the one provided by the labeler and the one that we're trying to mimic with our, learning, with our learned model. Uh, and then on the right, the, the, you know, what we're subtracting from it is the output of our model, is the output of our neural network, which is capturing the probability, or it represents the probability that we think, the probability that our model thinks the output should have been positive. So the difference is going to be how much they agree with each other, or rather how, how little they agree with each other. Right? If, the, if that difference were zero, then, then our model is outputting 100% probability of the, you know, uh, corresponding to the correct output. And if that difference is one, then we've gone the, totally the wrong way. So the absolute value of that difference is, the, is how wrong we were on this example. So that should give us an idea of why you know, why we scale h by that value. You know, we, it can be positive or negative, and the larger it is, the more wrong we were. And if we were perfectly right, we don't scale h at all in the gradient. It should sort of remind you, this whole thing should sort of remind you of what the perceptron does. Um, but it's not a precise analogy, so, you know, don't overthink it. Just get, just think about the intuition here. Okay, so, now that we have that, we're going to think about the gradient with respect to w11. So again, we still care about the log likelihood, but now we want to take the gradient not with respect to w21, but with respect, with respect to w11. And the key difference, one, one key difference here is that we're going to be dealing with the, uh, the h vector. And w11 is a term that affects the value of the h vector, whereas before we could treat the h vector as a constant. Uh, so we can proceed just as before by take, using the chain rule to work out the uh, deriv derivative of the log, uh, and then we, we're going to be dealing with the derivative of the output of our neural network, or the rather the likelihood determined by our output um, with respect to w11. So using a little bit of uh, algebra, we can work out something just like the expression we had in the last slide which is that the gradient is going to be the indicator function uh, minus the output of our neural network, all times the gradient of the inner, uh, the input to the last hidden, the last unit, the output unit, uh, with respect to W11. So one thing to be careful about is that you know, we're dealing with uh, the derivative with respect to, or the gradient with respect to W11, um, and W11 doesn't look like it appears in this expression, but of course it does, right? It's actually part of H. So one way we could write this is that we could, um, you know, we could just do, use chain rule, or it's not even, it's barely even chain rule, just using the, the fact that we're, this is a derivative of a linear product, um, and just pull out the derivative pull out from the derivative the weight vector w21. So that's what we did here. So we pull out the, the weight vector w21, and then uh, we, we can, okay, so this, this works, but we can actually examine this a little bit closer and realize that if we're interested in the weights or the derivative with respect to the weights for the first hidden unit, right, w11, not w12, uh, but w11, then we don't, there, there actually is no, uh, the, the weights, w11 have nothing to do with the second output or the or the the second entry in h or h2 as i called it so we don't really have to i mean technically what i wrote here on the bottom right is correct um but we, the the second term in that derivative in that gradient on the right or the second entry in the gradient vector on the right is going to be zero because it has no derivative with respect to the second term so we only care about the first term so let's just write down the the 
the wait for the first term. So we're only going to we're, we're going to index into w21 and just take the first entry. So this is the expression we care about. Okay, and then from here we can move on and just do a little bit more chain rule using uh, using the same derivative of the logistic function that we have in our back pocket, uh, and we get this term. So you can see here we just took the derivative, uh, and then the the derivative of the inner or the gradient of the inner function, which is w times x or w one one times x, uh, is just x i or x. So I will add one one thing, other thing. So I, this is a little minor flub in my math that uh, I don't think is worth redoing my slides to fix. Um, and but to, just to be just so you're aware of it, uh, the h in all these expressions that I have on the screen and on the previous slide technically should probably be h sub i, because the the hidden unit activation is going to be different for every single uh, example. So because I didn't write h sub i. It sort of looks like there's a single h shared across all n examples, and that's totally wrong. But I think you can figure it out. So you know it should be h sub i. And and it, and it just comes from the fact that h is shorthand for the output of sigma of w11 times xi and w12 times xi. Okay, so look wrapping all this up together. So, so okay, this is like a long expression. It's it's already uh, it's already kind of Overwhelming, but it's but it's uh, but we've only done like one layer, <laughs> so this is uh, you know we can't keep doing this, right? If this the neural network gets bigger, this is going to get really costly. And and even in the in the first two lines of this derivation, I really skipped a lot of math, um, which you know I encourage you I encourage you to work that out yourself. Uh, it's very similar to the math on the previous slide, um, but. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of work to get to these derivatives or these gradients. And we want to find a way to make it more systematic so that an algorithm can do it, or even so we can do it, but, but mostly so an algorithm can do it, or a computer program can do it. So let's look at these derivatives or these gradients. So in this, in this gradient for W11, we had this term. This term looked very similar to what we had calculated previously. And it turns out that this is this corresponds to the derivative of the log likelihood of a logistic squashed function, and that it looks like what you know what I wrote there: the log of the sigma times y i uh, times the input to the logistic function. Right? W W two one times h is the input to the logistic function, and that, and then we have the derivative of the activation values of the next layer with respect to that that input value, what, whatever was input to the logistic function. That's, that's, this, that's this green expression. Um, and that derivative is just the weight, right? It's just the weight of that, uh, that, that affects that value. And then finally, we have this term. And this is the derivative of the, the weights that we're interested in, or excuse me, of the, of the Hidden unit value with respect to the weights that we're interested in. So this is like the this is just like the single layer analysis where we're just looking at a single logistic function and we're trying to figure out its derivative or the derivative of that with respect to the, its weights or the linear weights going into that logistic function. So okay, putting these three pieces together and looking at it visually in the in the uh, neural network, they look kind of like this. So 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 the yellow the yellow part corresponds to the output and the loss function. The green part corresponds to the the weight connecting the last layer to the middle layer, which is the the layer we care about. And then the the salmon or pink colored area is the the weight vector, or it's the 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 squashing function happening at the layer for which the weights, or at the layer that our weights live in. And oftentimes people refer to this term on the left, the yellow term, as the raw error. And that's where this thinking about it as like, you know, the, the left hand side, the indicator function is the true value and the right hand side is the is the predicted value. That's where that becomes useful uh, to think of it as an error. And then this green part, the green, the weights is the blame for that error. It's how, how much influence did hidden unit one, H1, how much influence did H1 have on that, that mistake that we made? So that's a very interesting view of what the back propagation. And then on the right, we have the gradient of the blamed error. So 
here's the one here's the way that you think about this blame thing right so if that weight were zero if that weight were zero what would be the blame for the error well it would be zero there would be no blame because the the output of h1 or the value of h1 had no effect on the output at y or in other words any mistake you made is not h1's fault because if, if the weight were zero h1 had no interest h1 had no influence on what prediction we made but on the other hand, if W21 is huge, or the en first entry of W21 is huge, then uh, then unit H1 is very much responsible for the output that uh, that created this error, uh, right? And then and this is nice because if there's no error, it doesn't matter what the weight is. There's no gradient, right? So if the yellow part's zero, then there's no then there's no no problem, no gradient. But if there's a big error, then you have to think about how much weight was there between H1 and Y. Okay, so this is the idea. So what we're gonna do now with backpropagation is to constantly try to update how much error any particular hidden unit is responsible for, and then use that to figure out the derivative for the previous layer. So, so let's go to the matrix form now. So let's try to, try to write this down in a general form. Uh, and the reason we can write this in a general form is because we're gonna be dealing with these feed forward structures where, the, uh, where every unit in every layer is connected to every unit in the next layer. So we, if you think about the, the types, the number of weights that we need to handle between any given unit, these have very rectangular shapes, right? We have the connection from hidden unit one to hidden unit, you know, uh, or the next layer is hidden unit one and two and so on. So here's what it looks like. So we can write the vector of activation values for layer one as just h1 and that's going to be equal to some squashing function uh, applied to a weight matrix w1 times x and what that looks like is that uh, you know the first entry in that vector is equal to uh, the first row of w1 times x and then you know and we're going to assume that the squashing function is applied element wise so uh, the S function, it may not be the logistic function anymore, it's just some squashing function, um, it's going to be applied. So then the other thing to think about is, you know, what W1, the matrix W1 looks like, and W1 is going to look like this, where it's going to be shaped, uh, or it will have a size that is, you know, it'll, it'll have the uh, rows of the number of output units, and the number of columns will be the number of I input units. So that way, when we multiply it by the input vector, we end up with a vector that's the, the size, that's the number of output units. Okay, so once we have that established, so we're going to have these weight matrices, which correspond to the connection between any layer and any and its next layer. Uh, we can write down, you know, a bunch of these layers now, right? Just H2 is equal to, you know, the squashing function times W2 times H1. Um, and then eventually you get to h m minus one uh, is the squashing function of a w m minus one times h m minus two so the the second to last uh hidden layer is determined by the its weight matrix times the third to last hidden layer and then the final output the output is going to be you know our function f of x given w uh is going to be the squashing function applied to uh, the final weight matrix WM times the second to last hidden layer. Well, it's actually the last hidden layer, but we're just we're going to call it the second to last layer. Um, and and then maybe there's a loss function applied to f of x, or it's applied to the output. So there's some loss function is applied to the output. Um, we're not going to say what that loss function is, or you know, I'm going to leave it very modular here. So it could be different types of loss functions. And it could be, uh, oh, and on top of that, the, the squashing functions, I'm allowing them to be loosely defined here. They could be any function we can take the derivative of that's element-wise. And they don't have to be the same across layers. In fact, they don't even have to be the same within layers, but it's, you know, it's a little easier mathematically to write it as the same everywhere just for convenience. But you can work out how this could be such that the squashing functions are different everywhere, as long as you know what they are. Okay, so once you have this, the, this is how we can, con right, we can just calculate these uh, e equations moving forward, right? We start from the input, we do layer one, we do layer two, we do layer three, all the way to layer m minus one, and then we finally do the last layer. And then we compute the loss function.
So this is, that's uh, called forward propagation, as I mentioned before at the beginning of this video. And then from there, we can start doing back propagation. So back propagation is where we calculate this error. So this is the error. And it's actually a little different than the error we used before because it's uh, the error we used before is actually going to be the error of the previous layer, not the truly last layer. But this is the error for the last layer, for the very, very last output. So it's just the derivative of the loss function you know, with respect to the output. So then we uh, can use that to calculate the derivative or the gradient with respect to the last weight matrix. So we can calculate the gradient of the last weight matrix using this delta term uh, and multiplying it by the hidden unit activation. Then to propagate further back to the, to the previous layer, we can multiply the error by the weight matrix transpose, because now we're working backwards to the weight matrices. So we transpose the weight matrix, we multiply it by the, the error vector. And then we do this, this that funny circle, uh, that, that operator is gonna, I'm writing that to represent the uh, element-wise product. So the term on the left is a vector, the term on the right is a vector, so I wanna multiply them together element-wise. I don't wanna do a dot product. Um, and the element-wise product is with the derivative of the squashing function. So on the right, actually, the squashing function is also an element-wise. It's also an element-wise um, derivative, right? Because the, because s is an element-wise function. So in fact, okay, you don't need to know this at this point, but what's happening there is that right-hand side, that element-wise product, is actually multiplying by the Jacobian of the squashing function, which is a diagonal matrix of first derivatives. Because it's an element-wise function, uh, it, there's no off-diagonal entries in the, in the uh, Jaco Jacobian matrix. Okay, but you don't have to know that for now, just, just think about this recipe. So now here's the, uh, you can use that, that new error, right? Now that we have m minus one, we can use that, or delta m minus one, we can use that to calculate the derivative for w m minus one by multiplying it by the hidden layer m minus one. And we can continue doing this uh, for any layer, working backwards. And then finally, to the, in the last layer, we can calculate the derivative for or the gradient of the loss function with respect, with respect to the first weight matrix by just multiplying it by the original input x. So you can summarize all this in just a few equations. So you can ignore, uh, you know, I wrote out some intermediate steps. You can ignore the intermediate steps. Uh, here are all the equations you need to calculate backpropagation if you want to go ahead and implement it yourself, um, which you do for, you know, many classes like the ones I teach. But you don't, a lot of times, you don't, you, this is all done for you nowadays with all these great uh, modern deep learning software toolkits out there. But it's good to know how it works. So this is the, how you can do backpropagation when you have these matrix-shaped layers. Okay, so to close, I just want to, I want to talk about a few challenges and solutions for these challenges, or, or not solutions, but uh, uh, ways to avoid, or uh, ways to address these challenges uh, when we talk about learning with neural networks. So the challenges are that uh, the whole, the whole optimization is non-convex. Um, and, you know, in other videos, in, in my machine learning classes, I've t I talk about convex optimization for, like, support vector machine. Um, and there's, there's lots of nice things. And logistic regression is also another convex problem. Right? There's lots of nice things about convexity. Um, and one of them is that there's only one solution. Right? With neural networks, we don't have convexity. And there's lots of solutions. So that, that could be concerning, right? Because w what if you, you know, you spend a lot of compute hours learning a model and then you later try again and you learn a different model. Um, well, that's, that's okay, but then how do you know that any one of these two models that you learned is the best model? You, you really don't. Um, and so we have to address that somehow. Um, another challenge is that, that this general framework is, is actually, uh, in many ways, it's overpowered. Right? We can now build any neural network and just use backpropagation and train all the weights. And the problem is that there are theory, there, there are theorems uh, out there uh, that prove that neural networks can fit any function. In fact, a relatively simple neural network, well, I shouldn't say that, a, a single layer, a, a neural network with a single hidden layer can fit any function uh, given enough hidden units. So now, you know, how many hidden units do you need to fit 
a really weird function. Uh, that depends on, well, the math is out there, but you know, you, we don't actually, we probably need a lot of units to fit really complicated functions. But generally the rule is that we can fit any function with a neural network and we can build neural networks and we are in practice, you know, machine learning uh, developers and researchers are building networks that can fit really, really complicated functions. So we have this problem of overfitting, right? We could easily memorize all the data. Um, in fact, many of these modern deep learning networks do memorize their training data. Um, but then, you know, well, how do we avoid the problem of overfitting, which is that we might not be able to generalize to new data. So here are some rem remedies to for all this. One is regularization, and, and there are ways to regularize neural networks, um, meaning to make sure they don't learn totally wacky functions. Um, and some of them involve doing things like pretending some of the neurons don't exist, so like hiding the neurons every now and then while you're training. Um, and then there's things like parameter sharing. Uh, so convolutional neural networks do a lot of parameter sharing, uh, and you know, I'll point you to other videos about those because we won't discuss those in this video. But they're basically the networks that, that share parameters so that you're not learning a different weight for every single hidden unit and you can sort of find common patterns of that connect hidden units to other hidden units. Uh, and then things like pre-training, initializing the weights smartly, uh, there's things like training data manipulation. I mean, all these problems are roughly fixed if you have huge, huge, huge amounts of data to train from um, and doing things like manipulating your data to simulate having more data uh, sometimes works. And then, you know, huge data sets mostly alleviates these, alleviate these problem problems, um, but not always. So, so there's, there's a big open pr problem in machine learning these days, which is, you know, when will these neural networks work and when will they not work? And uh, we're, it's kind of a good problem that we have these days where, you know, in the past, machine learning models were basically like, they were not going to work, right? They're not going to work. They're going to work sort of. And so we're going to try them. And if they work slightly okay, we're going to be really excited. Nowadays, we have these deep learning tools that um, sometimes they really, really, really work well. And then sometimes they don't. And so I think we're in a much better place than we were. But we do have this problem where the theory is a little bit hard to grasp for both researchers and, and developers, we're, we're kind of stuck where we, we really don't have a good idea of how to quantify how well a neural network will work on any given problem uh, until we try it. And then we try it and we can measure it. We can do cross-validation. We can do all that stuff and measure it. But until we do that, we really have no good idea. And what I hope is that, you know, when I post this video, maybe in a few months, we'll have some new theory that helps us guide us in this direction. And then this, that, that statement I made will be obsolete. That would be great. I hope so. Well, anyway, I hope this video helps you with, with uh, learning neural networks and, uh, uh, and how neural networks themselves learn. And, and I apologize that I left up the old video with all these, you know, the few mistakes in it uh, for so many years but this will finally replace it. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the mistake was that I just left out the Y from inside the um, logistic function, and somehow the equation still worked out okay. So the, the recipes in the end were still correct in the old videos if you watch those. And I've always wanted to have like a cool YouTube uh, sign-off tag phrase. Um, 